I'm sorry, what are you saying? Just record, we're recording. Just want to make sure I got that started. Oh, thank you. It's, it's all yours. Thank you. All right, good morning. Today we will talk about how to rethink how you're going to be teaching in the era where we don't really have certain certain plans and we don't have anything finalized, at least majority of the of the institutions that I've been in contact with don't. So uh, we'll we'll start talking about about some basic design principles that will uh, that will translate well in this era of new teaching. I think that's what we uh, we want to call it for for this hour. And uh, hopefully you'll leave here with some practical suggestions and some practical strategies on how to approach your course design and how to approach thinking about, about your courses when it comes to, to this new teaching reality. So um, before, hopefully before we leave today, I will, or we will explore how new teaching is like grilling, but grilling an egg. So think about it, how would you grill an egg? and how would that maybe um, translate to the teaching or how, how teaching translates to grilling an egg. All right, so I'll let you think about it for a second. Meanwhile, we'll go forward with, uh, with our scheduled programming. And um, I do believe that I'm speaking for just about all of our institutions here at SUNY when I'm saying that uh, for the fall and for this whole new teaching system and teaching method that we're going to experience, there will definitely be less focus on face-to-face -face components and more focus on online components because of the physical distancing and mandate and um, all the guidelines that we are, we are receiving. So I'm wondering if that will translate into some form of multimodal instruction in your in your institutions multimodal meaning more than one modality in uh, in the in instruction so would would it be combination of face to face and online was it, would it go straight to online would it be synchronous would it be asynchronous would it be hybrid so we're going to talk about all those um, considerations as we are progressing in the webinar and I think for, uh, for certain, we are going to experience some challenges because we already have been. So I think that's not going to go away. And with that, I think we will need to put a lot of emphasis on our flexibility, on flexibility of our institutions and also flexibility of our students. So taking all these um, assumptions into consideration and um, just trying to think how we're going to think about about this new course or courses that we're developing for the fall and onward let's talk about uh what we know for sure we don't know how we're going to teach maybe we don't know how it's going to look like we don't know what our students are going to think we don't know how our students are going to complete the courses or not are there going to be any challenges on their part we don't know just about any of those um answers what we do know, though, is what we need to teach. We know that in, um, in um, a course on dolphins, we will have to teach on dolphins, right? So that is one stable, um, that is one stable factor in our teaching. We definitely know what to teach. We have the learning outcomes that we have to, uh, we have to make sure we are addressing in our courses. And uh, let's, take, let's take the learning outcomes and let's take the what to teach fact as our basis out of which we're going to start thinking about the courses, our new teaching courses. So uh, how do we do that? We will start with um, some core concepts that are in the courses. All right, so take um, maybe three to five core things that you want your students to leave with. Take those that without those concepts, the students are not going to be able to address any of the or some of the learning outcomes. And if those core concepts are not understood and taught, taught and understood, the course did not, was not successful. So take those complete essential basic core concepts and start analyzing the course from those. Identify what kind of information and what kind of material will you need to teach those core concepts? And also what skills will your students need to practice to be able to say, yes, I achieved this particular learning outcome. 
and also how much support and where and when you will need to offer to your students. So here, um, probably the way of thinking would be, is this definitely a face-to-face -face, um, subject? Is it something that cannot be very efficiently or in a short time duplicated in, online, in an online environment? Is that anything that maybe can be done online? Is there anything that can be done, done online with some challenges? So think about all those, all those questions when you're looking at those core concepts. So start with those. And I do believe once you have those figure out how to best, how to best teach those core concepts, you will have a lot of questions answered for yourself. So you will also probably, the modality will jump out at you. Maybe you will have um, something that is fully online and is asynchronous, which means like your regular online co courses. Maybe you will have something at the end of this analysis, you will come up with something that is online, but you definitely need the synchronous aspect of it because um, historically there are a lot of questions maybe around, around the topic and you definitely need to make sure that students have um, have space to be to to be able to ask those questions. So that might be something um, to keep in mind as well. Have some live sessions, and have it all be online. Or um, are we going to have a com combined online modality, which is, um, in um, in basic terms, synchronous and asynchronous together. So let's say if I have a fully online course, but I want some concepts to be definitely explored through live sessions. So that would, I would consider that a combined online. So everything is taken care of online. However, there are some live sections that, or sessions rather, that the students would have to would have to join. Or um, is my institution okay with doing hybrid? Is my institution okay with doing partially online and partially face-to-face? -face? So I think once you start thinking about the core concepts of your course and how to teach them, what materials you need, what support the students will need, those main concepts or those main core concepts will give you a lot of answers to how your course will look. So don't worry about the particularities or, or little, little details with scheduling and little details with anything else. Just worry about how to teach those three to five essential concepts. And once you do that, everything else will fall into, into its place. And hopefully with the institutional um, support, you will be able to teach the course you, you want to teach and to be effective as, um, as you want it to be. I think this might be a um, good, good uh, time to maybe ask questions, if there are any. I don't see any, Tonka. Everyone's really impressed with your use of the auto captions. In oh, <laughs> okay, I'm <laughs> using, thank you. That's what we were talking about, Leslie. I see, got it. I was, I was seeing chat um, the dings popping up, so I was wondering what that was. So that was the, the captions, yes. I'm using Google Slides. And I uploaded my PowerPoint presentation presentation into Google Slides, and I'm presenting. And as you're presenting, you have option to turn on the um, the open captions. So that's that's how I'm I'm doing this this portion. All right. There is a question that just popped up. Do you have thoughts on switching modalities mid semester? Right. I think that's definitely uh, when we talked about the whole challenges and flexibility. We need to be ready for that. And uh, uh, for later on, I have a practical advice, but I think I'll give it now because it makes sense. Um, my practical advice would be to chunk your materials in little courses. I know it doesn't, doesn't sound right, but let me explain. So if you have um, meaningful closed chunks, it's easier to move those around than if you have something that is more extended when it comes to content. So if you have, if you have a chunk of elephants, have it be one, one uh, unit, one, I, I don't wanna call it module because it might be multi-module unit, but let it be one closed unit. And then unit is then easier to move around. If you want to move it online, it's easier to move the whole thing online. If you need to move it in person because your school opens, it's easier to move the whole chunk uh, as one as one um, one unit. So think about the core concepts of your course as chunks, and then it will be easier to kind of stack them around and move them around than if you had the whole semester long um, uh, unit, right? So 
try to chunk it into more meaningful, uh, meaningful pieces and it will be easier for you to move around. I'm hoping that answers, um, answers the question. Can I now move on? Yep. All right, perfect, thank you. All right, there it is, the practical advice, chunk material. All right, so basic principles, how to, um, how to make sure that you're not losing sanity and your students are still in course, they're engaged and they know what to do. Uh, four of them, and I will talk about, about each of them in somewhat of a, of a detail. So first of all, definitely, if you are going to move, be moving around in modalities, or even if you're not, everything, this situation is so new to students, everything has to be super, super extra clear. Even if you had before, you had the advantage of, let's say the first week when students come on campus and you have the first session when you kind of explain how the course will run and the students will have um, place an option to ask questions. That particular session, um, you will do yourself a huge favor if you put it in writing and go over it several times. Have a colleague of yours go through it so that it makes sense to them as well. Because if you are mixing things, if uh, things are not as they used to be, you have already confusion incorporated into your course. So if you have something that is not 100% clear when it comes to syllabus, when it comes to course information, um, course information, if anything is unclear, then on top of anxiety and frustration because it's not something that I'm used to, and this is an addition to, to the frustration, right? So everything has to be very, very, very clear. As for the communication, I'm going to show you an example as well as we go on, just want to touch very quickly on each of those four. The communication, there is no such thing as too much, too much communication and too much feedback with your, with your students. There is nothing worse as a student who never signed up to be online and now has to be online or some portions of the course are online. There's nothing worse than uh, an instructor who is not responding. There's nothing worse as me as a student not knowing what I'm supposed to be doing and the instructor is not responding, right? So always make sure um, you reserve a lot of time, especially at the beginning of the semester for communication, for messaging, for emailing, uh, answering students' questions. Again, it's very good um, practice to have a ask a question maybe discussion in your course if, if you are basing your course online so that students are able to ask all those questions in, um, in that particular discussion. And you know, if one student has a question, there is a very good possibility that more students will have the same question. So if it's there and visible to everybody, it will be very helpful um, for, for the students to be able to, to navigate how the course runs. So communication, again, no such thing as too much feedback. Present are very closely related to communication. Make sure the students know you're there. Make sure the students know you care. And again, I will give you some strategies on how to accomplish that and be flexible. This is a new situation to you as it is to your students. So be, be kind to yourself. Don't expect that everything will have to be 100% out of the gate because it might not be. It might but it might not. And then again, give students the same flexibility and the same kindness that you're showing to yourself. Just it's new to them. So if some, if you are able to maybe extend that line of things, if you're able to provide additional instructions, that's a, that's a very good strategy. To, uh, All right, if you're hearing growling in the background, it's not me, I promise, it's my dog. I guess that's her time to chew her toy and toss it around, so that's that. It's not me. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the clarity. Um, I think the number one, well, two number one documents that you need to concentrate when, uh, when this whole new teaching situation starts is your course syllabus and your course schedule. If you have something, if you have uh, different, different methods of submitting things, if you have different methods of of attending class, make sure everything is very clear in, um, in the course schedule, right? So if you're, um, the schedule that I have on the screen is uh, counting on students submitting some of their assignments in the LMS, and some of the assignments are submitted through Panopto, which is a video 
uh, video streaming service, right? So um, make sure that students understand where to submit what. And I know it might be explained somewhere in the course, but let's make one document where students can come to for any questions when it comes to logistics and uh, so they don't have to jump through through assignments to get to where they need to go. Everything will be in one place in, um, in the course schedule. So again, if everything is submitted through LMS, you probably don't need this, this type of detail. You probably don't need all this information. But if you have different ways of submitting assignments, definitely make sure uh, to list it in your, in your course schedule so that it's very clear. And again, if you have synchronous activities, make sure the students understand how to join them. Make sure you have all your, uh, if you're using, let's say if you're using Collaborate Ultra, make sure you have all your sessions already pre-created and the links are already in the, in the schedule. So again, there is absolutely no question how to join, where to join, what to click on and when. If you have, uh, so let's say this is synchronous, asynchronous uh, combination. Let's say you have a hybrid course where you will have some in-person courses or in-person sessions rather, and you will have some online sessions. Again, make it very clear what module is going to be taught where. Because again, there's nothing worse than missing a class because the, um, the schedule was not clear. So uh, if, you have, if you have your in-person courses, in-person sessions rather, in same room, you might not need to put room 204 on, in, every single, in every single module. But if you are meeting at different, different spots, and you might be because of the, the physical distancing and the guidelines that are recommending staggering schedules. So you might be moved around, you know, in, um, uh, throughout the campus. It depends on, on how the situation will, will pan out. So if you are, make sure every single room is listed on the schedule up front. And one other thing that is extremely helpful in the situation like this, where there is a lot of uncertainty, if you are able to let the students preview the course before the semester actually starts, that can be extremely helpful. It is helpful under regular circumstances. It's triple, if not quadruple, help as helpful in circumstances that we are in right now. So you have to, well, no, you don't have to, but if you are able to, if your, your campus, your institution allows you to open your courses maybe a week early, it's very helpful because if there are any technical uh, requirements, any special equipment student has to have, um, it's good if they have more time to prepare for it. Also, some students live in households, household with, I don't know, three other siblings and um, now mom and dad and whoever else are at home. So they might need to say, okay, well, this is the schedule. I will need this particular room for this time. So all that is very good to know or to have for the student before the semester starts so that you don't have to hustle and bustle as the semester is going and then the student is trying to figure out how life is supposed to be combined with all this, right? So if you are able to, definitely at least the course syllabus and course schedule provide to your students before the semester starts. Very, very helpful. If you have non-traditional students, if you have adult students, that's, that's almost a must because the life that non-traditional students have is a little more complicated uh, when it comes to responsibilities and when it comes to appointments and, and uh, daycare and anything else. So for if you are teaching non-traditional students, the, the preview of the course before the semester starts is, I would say, almost a must. So think about, think about if you're able to do that and to give that, that extra information to your students before the semester starts. All right, uh, what questions do we have about, about the scheduling and anything that I talked so far? Is there anything I need to address? Um, not seeing anything right now. A lot of the discussion going on back channel, but. Oh, okay. Uh, someone said, how early do you suggest opening the course? Um, definitely as early as you can. Probably a week is what I'm hearing from other institutions are doing. So probably a week would be okay. But then again, it depends on what is going on in your course. If you have a lot of back and forth within online and, and in person, that might be, 
you know, it might be more useful if you maybe enable it two weeks beforehand. Uh, again, with that comes also a statement or a note that if you do enable something to be previewed early, make sure you don't change it between now and when the semester starts, right? Because if, um, if you open it for students early and I am in as a student and I upload, I download my, I download the syllabus and I print it and I already schedule my life around the schedule and then suddenly if there's something else when the semester starts, it's, it's completely useless for me, right? So once you have it finalized, final, finalized, that's when you are, that's when you are able to open the, um, the course syllabus and schedule. Just, just think about the, when is it going to be final? And if it is, and if it's before a week before the semester, that's, that's wonderful. All right, let's go to communication. I already talked about it a little bit. There is no such thing as too much, too much feedback. And as you communicate with your students, there are several ways. Um, the personal way is always the best. So of course, students are expecting announcements. Of course, students are expecting bulk communication that you send out to the entire class, and that's fine. But also what you, what you want to probably beef up in this situation when um, a lot of it is, is uncertain is personal communication. So let's say, let's say uh, somebody submitted the first assignment that was excellent. Uh, make sure you, you take the time and email them personally. Hey, uh, Susan, your first assignment was wonderful and I especially liked yada, yada, yada. So make sure it's personalized. And once the students are able to feel the ground under their feet, they're going to be more mod motivated to persevere when the going gets tough, right? So make sure you acknowledge all the little achievements, um, all the little successes that the students, students have. And if you are able to do it personalized, in a personalized way, that is very effective when it comes to motivating students to persevere. Um, also, what I, what I would suggest is after each chunk, each module or each unit, I also suggest sending out um, maybe a bulk announcement saying this is what we learn in this in this chunk and this is how this prepared us for module number two so that they can see they can see the relevance of what they're doing going forward to their um, to their future work in this course so that it's not perceived as busy work it's not perceived as something that you can get by without or get yeah, you know what I mean. So something that is relevant and something that is will be beneficial to them. So always try to summarize at the end of one unit, try to summarize what happened in this unit, what good points were made, and how that is going to help with our future studying or studying of, of this subject. So that's the communication. Let's go to teaching present strategies. So this is a little, um, little more fun. We're getting into, into more fun around here. You can okay. tell me. Yes, sir. There's a question I think is really important and someone asked about communication when there are more than 20 students in the class and how to manage that. So some folks might be have you know, 30, 40, If 50. there is more than what students? I'm sorry. More than like 20, oh, 25, right? Yeah. So how do you uh -huh. start to maintain that communication uh -huh. strategies for a larger class? Right. So, okay. Um, personalized is important here as well. What I sometimes do um, these days, I don't teach too huge of a courses, but maybe a couple, three, four years ago, I did. And what I did, I had a, I had two different, I guess, templates for messages. So I would just copy paste basically, but I would make sure always to include the student's name. So I would include, hi, Susan, and then something generically praising that I can tell or I can say that about students work and I would just copy and paste. So the personalized doesn't necessarily mean that you have to spend hours on, um, on crafting. Personalized just can be that, yes, I'm acknowledging you. And even though it's, it's the same or very similar message as I sent to Tom, it's just okay because the, the student knows that I care. I care about you in particular. I don't care about you as a number necessarily, or I don't care about you as a mass of students, but I care about you as a person. So um, there, are, there are some shortcuts, you know, the copy and paste for sure um, comes in. When I provide feedback and in my first, in my first module, which is really funny because all those courses or all those semesters that I've taught the same course, 
the feedback is just about the same for the first module um, for the first module assignments. I am requiring students to cite, so you know for sure there will be a problem with citations because that's that's where the life is these days. So there will be problem with citations. So I have a little pre-formatted um, message that I send out about citation. Uh, there's definitely many times an issue with structure of argument. So I will send a little pre-formatted message about that. So I do send a lot of feedback, but not all the feedback is necessarily created at that moment. A lot of it is, you already know, you already can predict what's going to happen in each assignment and where the issues might be. So you might, you know, you might save uh, your feedback that you sent, that you sent to your student. You might send, you might save it and uh, repurpose it for, for multiple students. All right, hopefully that answers the, answers the question, did it? I'm just wondering if we need to talk more about it. Um, looking at the questions, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think just keep going for now and I'll, you know, okay. if something comes up, I'll, All right, a lot so of back channel discussion going on. So it's hard to kind of keep track of each individual question, yeah. Well, I'm very grateful for you because I know I wouldn't be able to to present and to keep track of the of the chat for sure. So thank you, Chris. All right. So teaching teaching uh, presence and how do you make sh make sure your students students feel as as though if you I mean students feel that you care and that they belong somewhere because I don't know if you know, but number one reason why students quit um, online courses under regular circumstances is lack of social interaction. Number one, it's not um, anything time related. It's not anything um, environment related. It's not anything but the lack of social interaction, number one. So that is under regular circumstances. You can imagine when you when you add anxiety to it, it's probably even more that um, that important the, the social interaction and make sure that you establish you sta you establish the community in your in your course. And um, there, I it, in addition to you being when you are in the teaching mode, right? When you are sending all those messages that we talked about, when you are sending announcements when you are providing a lot of feedback on every announcement, uh, every assignment rather. So in addition to those live um, actions or live strategies, there are also some strategies you can build into the course that are there and uh, they actually take your course and your teaching presence quite a, quite a long way. So I give you, I give you a couple of strategies here. Um, definitely use something ungraded, something informal, something where students can just chat freely. Sometimes you don't even have to go into those chats. You don't even have to uh, participate in it. Just something where they would feel like they have a buddy in the, in, a, in the course, you know, somebody that they can relate to. So how do I do that? I do it through polls and I uh, also use informal discussion. So let's talk a little bit about polls. Polls, um, if you are teaching in, no technical information, if you are teaching in Blackboard, um, there are polls or surveys rather, but um, they are not, you are not able to share the, uh, the results after one submits their, um, their uh, response. I do like when students are able to see what other students submitted. I do like that feature because that is that is the cement that holds them together, right? So if I submit something, I want to know what others did, how others uh, responded, and that's what that's what creates the community. So if you are teaching in Blackboard, I definitely recommend to use um, SurveyMonkey. And there is a free version and in that free version you are able to enable results to be seen immediately after submission so that is that is one feature of um, that i prefer survey monkey over the surveys in um, in blackboard if you are teaching using moodle they have very good i think they still have a very good polling uh, tool in Moodle and in Moodle you are able to actually show them the results immediately after they submit. So here um, you are seeing one of the polls that I use and is actually very successful in my course um, to the tunes of 
20% better result. And I'll, I'll talk, to, talk to you a little bit about it. So the jar, the jar activity or the jar poll that I have in my course, and I have it in every week. Um, my modules are weekly and I have this activity every week. And every week uh, students can choose different, um, different response. So uh, I'll read it, read it to you in case you're not, you're not by the computer. This is a jar with some things you might need this week. Pick what you need and keep it with you for the rest of the week. And the options they can select from are hope, patience, wisdom, strength, love, inspiration, luck, peace, focus, and perseverance. So they pick one and as you can imagine, it's very important for them to know what others pick. So um, in the weeks or in modules where I'm seeing a lot of strength being picked, I would definitely address that in an announcement. I would say, okay, I'm seeing a lot of you need strength this week. I'm hoping that you will be able to get it. And here are some strategies for how to whatever, whatever, right? So always acknowledge if there is a trend in those polls, always acknowledge the results. So they will keep your students engaged with you as an instructor. And not only that, it will help your students engage within each other because they know, oh, okay, well, I'm not the only one who's struggling here. Apparently, there are four other students who are, and they all chose the strength as, as their number one thing they want to keep. So it is very important to have this emotional connection with other students in the course, especially in the times like, like these times. So uh, you are free to steal this. Um, I have emailed the PowerPoint already to Victoria and she will be uploading it together with the recording. So feel free to steal it um, for sure. Uh, you are able to, to adjust it to, to however you want it. This is not my idea. Actually, I saw it somewhere several years ago at a, I think I read an article actually about it. There was a college that was in-person college um, majority of their courses were in person and throughout the midterm and the finals, they had a campus priest or campus, I don't know, minister, I guess. And he, he put that, um, he put out the, the sign on their, on their boards, on their bulletin boards. And if you can remember, um, Many times ago, if, you, if uh, students wanted to sell something or buy something, they would create an ad and then they would have the little pieces of paper that you can tear off with the phone number. So that's how he would have the, uh, the little things that the students might need. So I got, I got inspired by that. I was like, well, if that can be created on campus, that definitely can be created in an online, um, online environment. And it can. And it's actually very... Um, uh, how should I say, very impactful. Uh, if anybody uh, ever comments on any of the assignments in my courses, it's this particular assignment, which is really funny because it's informal. There, it's not graded, of course. It's just there to be taken or not. And uh, that has a huge impact on my student. And actually, I was looking back at the courses with this particular poll and courses without this poll. And I found out that the courses with this poll in the discussions, in the graded discussions, I have 20% more participation than in your regular courses without this poll. So um, there is something to it. There is something to students feeling they belong. There is something to students feeling that you care. And again, you can create it one time and you can just copy and paste throughout your whole entire course and it's going to cost you five minutes of your time. And if it is going to tell your students that you care, I think it's time well spent and it's a great, great bank for your, for your five minute buck, I guess. So again, please feel free, to, feel free to reuse it. I also have used some silly polls, like do you ever talk to yourself? And uh, I especially like the, the last one, if someone weighs 99 pounds and eats one pound of nachos, is that person 1% nacho? Uh, I especially like that one that gets, that gets my students, students going. So those silly polls are good too, but they, I did not see as great of a result as I saw with the emotional one the emotional connection was, was much stronger effect than, uh, than just the silly polls that I, that I incorporated. They are always attended. Students do participate in them, even towards the end of the semester. 
but um, when it comes to them, to students participating in the course overall, the silly polls do not really uh, carry that much, that much influence. So again, you're free to reuse them. Just make sure those things are informal and ungraded because that's why, uh, that's why they work because they are ungraded, right? That's why they work because it's not something required. It's something that you give students to participate in and to, uh, to create a community with. All right, so polls. Can we, do we need to stop before we go to the next strategy or can we go? There's a couple of questions I think that kind of relate. One, one person had asked earlier about um, all the suggestions that they've seen so far related to you know, making the transition to remote and online seem very structured. And you know, what about faculty who like to kind of um, you know, improvise a little bit you know, and not always be sort of locked down into you know, a very rigid approach? And then someone else also said that, you know, that, that the idea of connect, connecting to students has a lot to do with seeing their faces and hearing their voices and are there ways to sort of um, you know, do that online. So again, sort of related. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, right, the structure and unstructured thing, uh, you definitely can go to town when it comes to structure or lack of it. Uh, it needs to be though clear what you're doing to students, right? So if you are moving in a, in a nonlinear format through your course, that's fine too. Just make sure it's very clear and understandable from your syllabus. And uh, I'm pretty sure the students, it might take them a little bit longer to figure it out, but I'm sure if it's clear in the syllabus and course schedule, it, they will figure it out. They will figure out what to do and, uh, and when to submit what and how to participate where, for sure. And the other question was about uh, the face, about, seeing faces. Yeah, and hearing voices and you know, um, mm -hmm. suggestions for, for doing that in an online class. Right. Well, you can definitely use live sessions. Um, we talked about it a little bit at the beginning. You can create, uh, your course can be created fully online, that's fine, and just have live sessions just like the one we are having right now, the, the webinar session. You can have that. Uh, now, I would, be, I would be quite cautious about requiring students to use a camera and microphone because some students are, just like I said, might be living with a couple other siblings. Some students might not be living in the conditions that they are proud of. Some students might be living in, um, in households where there is not much quiet. So if you are requiring students to use camera and microphone, some students might be very uncomfortable with that. So um, I have talked to one of my colleagues here in, here in Canton because I am also, just like you guys are, I believe, judging from the question, proponent of, of seeing people, or being able to see people. And she was telling me exactly the same, the same example I'm telling you. And then she says, well, what I usually do, I call on them just to make sure that they're there and they're engaged. I call on them and I ask question, hey, Susan, whatever, whatever the question is, right? And then Susan can, can choose whether she can, whether she wants to respond in a chat, whether she wants to respond using microphone. So the engagement is still there, and, uh, but it does not have to be forced through the microphone or through the camera. Also, if you decide to do it this way, I would make sure that at the beginning of live sessions, the students do understand that this is going to happen, that I will call on you so that um, you are not losing students in the middle of, um, of the live session. So I think it really depends on um, cohort or it differs from cohort to cohort. And if you are maybe at the beginning of the course, you can send out a poll and say, hey, are you going to be comfortable talking on camera using microphone? And you can see, uh, you can see where the temperature is. If they're okay with that, then you can, you can require that. If they're not, then I definitely would be sensitive to, um, to those students with households that are not that wonderful to show on camera or on microphone. So um, that's one of, the, one of the considerations. All right, I'm going to move on to informal discussions. Those are very important to have um, in an, definitely in a situation that we're going into right now. Those discussions where you are taking temperature, where are we? Are we doing okay? Are you going to, are you able to find your materials? And again, something that is not graded, that is not forced, um, is something that students will 
many times take advantage of. Now also you need to make sure they understand that they can message you privately. So if there is something that they're not happy about or there is something they're not able to grasp, they're able to email you or message you privately. They don't need to disclose the situation in a discussion that is visible to everybody. So um, there's also there should also be always a way or methods to um, for a student to be able to engage with you on a private on a private basis. Now the informal discussions that always work for me are at the advice corner. I always have that in the second module. And here I am posting somewhat of a let's help each other scenario. It's not a real scenario. It's just um, if you are new to online learning, ask questions that you want answered. If you are not that new to online learning or if you know already how to navigate in this environment that we are in, give your classmates a couple of, a couple of pieces of advice how to, how to figure out this, this new life, this new way of learning. And um, that definitely gets students students going. And I do have a lot of um, old timers, I would say, that just just post advice. And um, a lot of it usually has to do with time management. A lot of students has advi have advice on how to how to make sure you're staying on task. So that's number one topic that I usually see in those advice corner discussions. Uh, sometimes I post in there saying what makes a successful student. So always make sure you ask questions if you are lost. Always make sure you read all the instructions and you know all the good stuff that we are trying to get our students to do all the time. So sometimes I post in there. Uh, sometimes just student students take on with, with the advice corner, but it's a good good opportunity for them to to talk about those things and how to be successful in the course. So always have it at the beginning of the of the semester. What is your movie situation? Just some fun thing that uh, students do engage with. Anything funny happened to you lately again? How is your learning going? If you are um, if you are, if your campus is using Oscar rubric, uh, how is your learning going in is answering one of the standards in that ask in that Oscar rubric? Um, it's asking the Oscar rubric is asking for students to be able to reflect on their learning and how their learning is going. So this is this is a direct answer to that particular standard. If you are not using Oscar standard, that's fine too. It's still very helpful. How is your learning going? And usually, what I ask there, I ask Asked, uh, I ask questions that are very directly related to how they are working, not uh, if you're happy with the grades, but are you happy with how much work you put into learning, right? And if you're not, what is your plan for improvement? Um, how do you think you can, you can finish this semester strong? So I always make sure that the um, the locus of control, I guess, is in the student's corner. Always make sure that it's not something that, oh, my instructor's um, day was starting bad. He didn't have enough coffee, so that's why I got an F. That's, that's not where I'm going with this. I'm going with this, what do I, as a student, need to do to improve the situation? Or if I'm getting all A's and I'm very happy with my results, what do you think, um, what do you think contributed to those good results? What, what habit of mine was the one that made the decision that whether I'm going to be successful that or, woman was elderly when she or was not, su not successful. I mean, really so always, um, I usually, usually do that or have that discussion in the middle of the semester so that they already know where the course is going and they still have a chance to improve their, their learning habits, improve their, their grades as, as they go towards the end of the semester. Um, do we need to stop here for any any discussion about informal discussions? Um, I don't think so. Again, there's a lot of back channel discussion, but everyone's kind of addressing each other. So okay. I think uh, there's like five minutes left. So Okay. Yeah. All right, good. So at the beginning, I promised to tell you how the new teaching is like grilling an egg. So if you take an egg and just crack it open on the grill, there is not much egg left for you to eat, right? So there's not really, um, 
Like if you have a sausage hamburger, you just put it on the grill. You cannot just put an egg on the grill because it will go nowhere. So what you can do though, you can crack an egg into a little pan and put that pan on the grill. So the teaching, the new teaching is like grilling an, an egg in a way where the end can be accomplished. However, you need to figure out a different method of doing it. So you can still grill it, but you have to grill it in a pan or you know, on the foil or some, some other material where the egg doesn't, doesn't run all over the place. So again, uh, it's all doable that we're going through right now. It's all doable. We just need to figure out that one way that will work for us and will work for our learning outcomes and will work for our students. So just, um, just a very quick summary. Um, if you are going through a tough time trying to figure out how your course will happen, always think about those core concepts in the course and they will guide, they will guide you into, into, is it going to be an online course? Is it going to be in-person course? Is it in combination? Is it fully online, asynchronous, is it synchronous? So always have those core concepts in your head before you decide how the course will be. And once you have the course concept, try to chunk the content around those so that you can easily switch things around if necessary and you're more flexible, you be, you're prepared to be more flexible. So if you have that, that definitely, um, will be of benefit to you. And then uh, once you have the course con concepts figure out, a lot of it just will fall in place because it will kind of have to pad whatever the course core concepts were and how you figure them out. All right, I do believe that is the official end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to run into chat. So um, Chris doesn't have to translate. <laughs> Now, there's one that popped up there at the end, an example of how you might describe expectations for student participation and discussion boards in the syllabus. There's a mm -hmm. lot of stuff out there for examples, but what is you, what do you, what do you usually, what message do you usually give students? Right. Well, um, I try to be as flexible as I can. Now, of course, nobody has taught in this coming up fall, this fall semester yet. So I cannot tell you what works, what doesn't work, but, but, uh, from the previous experience in a situation like this, if you're flexible, that will work. So I will, I will try to have, um, I will try to ha have live sessions in my course for sure, just to have that, uh, that interaction going with the students between me and the students and then students among each other. So I would definitely have the live sessions. I would, I would want the live sessions to be not mandatory, but strongly recommended. And I would definitely um, record those sessions and the recording will be posted in uh, whatever LMS uh, you're working with. So um, I would for sure make it flexible in a way. Now, sometimes we want to make sure that the students are attending or are viewing. So maybe you can have a little hidden treasure hunt in your, in your live sessions, right? So you can say, uh, I will need you in your course, in your online course, say, um, don't give them the topic of the discussion if you have online discussions, but say the topic will be announced during the live session. So they either have to attend in person or they have to view the, um, they have to view the recording. So always give a little, little gems hidden here and there just to entice them to watch it, just to entice them to participate. So I would not require those live sessions because of the situation we are in but I would definitely make it so that they have to, you know, just hide things, hide things around. So uh, somebody did mention, it sort of follows what you were just talking about, asking about, you know, if there are situations, a high flex situation where you have some students in the classroom and maybe some students joining online. Do you have thoughts mm -hmm. about that? I mean, you know, there've been sessions yeah. about that and everyone's been talking about that lately, but a lot of folks were asking about if you direct. Right, right. Our campus is one of those who have been has been doing it for a while. And um, we do have very strong proponents of, of high flex. Now with the situation that we're going in right now with the whole physical distancing, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. And how do you because if you want to be 100% flexible, then there is a situation possibility where 100% of students show up on campus, right? And then you cannot accommodate 100% of your class because the room is not large enough to accommodate for, for physical distancing. So 
I do like the flexibility of it for sure, but I think it needs more planning when it comes to when it comes to institution just to make sure that we are following the guidelines. I do like the idea of it for sure. I like when when student is able to 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 select method uh, how they want to attend the class. I know it's definitely more work for for the instructor to make sure that any com any possible combination is still effective. And there are situations where the student the instructor comes to class and is the only person in class. So that definitely has happened on our campus before. And then you will have to give a lecture to nobody <laughs> because everybody is online or everybody will be watching the uh, the presentation on uh, from from the LMS so I am a proponent of it but uh, it has to be carefully planned when it comes to how the whole physical distancing will work because you cannot have 100% of, of students in a classroom I don't think without violating some of those guidelines so I don't have answer, but I do have concern, I guess. I don't know if that helps or not. It's going to be an experiment in the fall. I think we'll learn a lot more six for months sure. from now about that. So we are at time now. I want to thank you, Tonka, for your time. Uh, and I did put in a link in the chat to where all the video recordings and all the materials will be on the SUNY RTI website. Um, so uh, go there. Uh, the next thing coming up today is at noon. So I'm just going to... Uh, leave this going. I will stop the recording shortly. And, you know, Tonka, if you want to stick around and uh, chat with folks, uh, you're welcome to do that. So, Absolutely. Thank you. I'll Thanks be here. So much. Thank that you very great. much. Thank you. I saw a question. I think somebody was.